Coming up on the show, the mayor says resources for migrants in Chicago are drying up. A man in Aurora is charged with threatening to kill Governor J.B. Pritzker. And Illinois takes a major step to ban the book bans. Those stories and much more in our one-hour weekly news recap. Remember, you can watch us break down the news on YouTube and Facebook. It's all happening right after the latest news from around the country and the world. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Lakshmi Singh. The global fight against COVID-19 has reached a milestone. Though the coronavirus outbreak remains a pandemic, the World Health Organization says it no longer considers it a public health emergency. But NPR's Nareet Eisenman says global health officials are urging governments not to become complacent in their prevention and treatment of current and future COVID threats. They're still calling for ongoing surveillance, uh, ongoing vaccinations, uh, and they're particularly uh, concerned about making sure that the world is aware of any new variants that might emerge, uh, because they also warn that if that happens, you know, and it's a variant that that does cause a new kind of emergency, you know, they might go back and declare, you know, that it is an emergency again. NPR's Nareet Eisenman reporting. Within hours of the WHO's announcement, the White House confirmed that a significant figure in the oversight of the anti-COVID response in the U.S. is stepping down from her post. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky is resigning. President Biden credits Walensky with helping to turn the tide on the health crisis in this country. The Biden administration wants to see changes to heighten the security of more military bases in the U.S. NPR's Kristen Wright reports the move comes after a Chinese firm tried to build a facility near an air base in the Midwest. The Treasury Department proposal requires foreign citizens and businesses to gain U.S. government approval to buy property within 100 miles of an expanded list of military installations. The rule change would add eight military bases to the list of highly sensitive installations, giving the federal government jurisdiction over land transactions in those surrounding areas. The list includes Grand Forks Air Force base in North Dakota. A Chinese company tried to build a corn milling plant 12 miles from the base. The Air Force said the project posed a threat to national security and the plans were eventually dropped. Kristen Wright, NPR News, Washington. Anger is growing in New York City over the choking death of Jordan Neely, a 30-year-old black man who was killed Monday on a subway train. The city medical examiners ruled the death a homicide. NPR's Brian Mann reports so far there have been no arrests. This incident is proving to be a flashpoint in the larger conversation in New York about race, homelessness, mental health, and public safety. Witnesses say Jordan Neely, who was homeless, was yelling about needing food and being willing to die before a white man put him in a chokehold. The NYPD and the Manhattan District Attorney's Office are investigating what led to that confrontation on a Manhattan subway train. City Mayor Eric Adams, a former police officer, has so far declined to condemn the violence, saying the public should wait until investigations are complete. City Council President Adrian Adams criticized police for not making arrests, saying the response has been shaped by racial bias. Brian Mann, NPR News. The Dow is up 420 points. This is NPR News. 73 degrees, sunny skies, 1204. Good afternoon. I'm Lisa Lobbis. This is WBEZ News. Chicago Park District pools do not have a confirmed opening date for this summer season. WBEZ's Claire Lane has the story. Park District officials say they're still in the recruitment phase of lifeguards for city pools. And an opening date cannot be determined until enough candidates complete their certification requirements. City pools were delayed in opening last year from June 24th to July 5th because of a lifeguard shortage. The district's Irene Tostado says applications opened earlier this spring to avoid that. And the district will pay a $600 bonus to lifeguard candidates who complete training and fulfill their duties this summer. Tostado says the average hourly wage is going up to $17.45 for new and returning lifeguards. Claire Lane, WBEZ News. A member of the Proud Boys from West Suburban Aurora bragged about being promoted to the highest rank of membership in that far-right group after he stormed the U.S. Capitol in body armor and a ballistic helmet on January 6th of 2021. The Sun-Times reporting 25-year-old James Robert Elliott assaulted a police officer during the insurrection by hitting him with a flagpole. Elliott pleaded guilty to assaulting the officer in November. Federal prosecutors want Elliott to serve nearly three and a half years in prison for his role in the riot. He's set to be sentenced on two 
Tuesday in federal court in Washington, D.C. Cubs hosting Miami this afternoon. The White Sox are in Cincinnati tonight. The Sky opening the WNBA preseason in Dallas tonight. This is WBEZ. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Progressive Insurance, where drivers can compare direct rates using Progressive's rate comparison tool. Customers can see options and rates side by side. More at Progressive.com or 1-800-PROGRESSIVE. This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. Happy Friday. We made it through another busy week. And if you can't remember what happened in the news over the last few days, well, you're not alone and you're in the right place. It's time for our weekly news recap. Breaking news. Guilty verdicts for all four defendants in the comment for federal bribery trial. We are tired of political corruption. (laughs) In general, with the ComEd 4 trial now over, the big question becomes how does the outcome impact Michael Madigan's own corruption case coming up next April? You have the people who are alleged to be his cronies who are found guilty. Um, I imagine he's not a happy camper. In the meantime, prosecutors are hoping it shows politicians that corruption will be uncovered here in Illinois. That's a lot, and there's way more here to help us make sense of these stories. Chicago Tribune investigative reporter Ray Long. Ray is also the author of The House That Madigan Built, the record run of Illinois' Velvet Hammer. Good to have you back, Ray. Good to be here. Thank you, Sasha. Mike Lowe is a reporter for WGN-TV News. Welcome back, Mike. Hey, thanks. It's Good been to be a back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and David Grising is here, president of the Better Government Association. Hey, David. Hello, Sasha. Let's give a special shout out to the folks who are watching us break down the news right now live on WBEZ's <laughs> Facebook and YouTube pages. All right. The week saw a, gr- a guilty verdict uh, in the ComEd bribery trial. I wonder where you all think this case fits in Chicago's long history of corruption. Wow, it's a uh, it's a landmark of sorts. Um, yeah. you, clearly, we've had uh, others uh, that are big trials. George Ryan's uh, conviction, Rod Blagojevich's conviction. We've had other major uh, figures along the way: Rostenkowski, uh, Dan Walker, another governor. You know, it goes on and on through the uh, city council, of course, where there's been dozens. It's just another four names to add to the list. Yeah, these four, but they are really a curtain raiser to that uh, question that you raised about what happens now with Michael Madigan. How significant is this, David? Well, it's it's huge because what was put on trial really is the culture of corruption in the state legislature and the state more broadly. And the defense was, well, yeah, things kind of smell sort of bad, but this is just the way politics happens. Uh, they perhaps should have taken notes of the Rod Blagojevich trial because Blagojevich tried that and it didn't work that time either. Mm-hmm. And uh, as as a resident of the state of Illinois and as somebody who believes in good government, I frankly was thrilled with this verdict because, yes, it is the culture is more corrupt than it should be. And in fact, it's illegal. And so it's great to see that declared. I'm curious to see what happens with the Madigan case now because um, he must be uh, shivering a little, maybe. Well, well, one of the jurors that Ray interviewed, and Ray did some great reporting for the entire trial. I'm sure it took over your life. Oh, yeah. But one of the jurors afterwards said something to the effect of, Mike Madigan was behind all of this. Right, right. uh, Caused all of this to happen, I think was the direct quote. Um, So you... When you talk about a curtain raiser, we we kind of are getting a sense of where this is headed. Yeah, yeah I think it's a sign that the public is fed up, too. And uh, not only did they, I thought this was a very conscientious jury. They were taking notes like I've never seen before. And uh, though I've covered the legislature most of my career, I've covered a lot of trials, mm-hmm. too. And this jury seemed like they were really tuned in. Well, let's dig into that. Uh, I have a clip here of juror Amanda Schnitker Sayers. Here's what she had to say about the verdict. All of us agree that lobbying is necessary for our legislators to be educated. This is not lobbying. So walk us through how the jury members reached the gu- the guilty verdict. Well, I, you've got the four defendants, obviously, but one of the key things that they th- thought was this whole idea that there were subcontractors put on the payroll of lobbyists who were paid by ComEd. So let me let me just break that down a little bit, Sasha. Uh, so 
they saw it as an attempt to bribe Madigan uh, to look favorably upon their legislation. So the money uh, did not go, as uh, we have heard, uh, the idea of a uh, bag of cash handed over to somebody. It went like this. It started with ComEd. They would pay one of their lobbyists. In this case, a lot of it went to Jay Doherty, a, a former president of the City Club here in, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. He then would put uh, Madigan allies like precinct captains and former aldermen uh, onto his payroll. He would not mention them. And then in the contract with ComEd, and then he would pay them. They wouldn't do any work, and they were put there because they're allies of Madigan. So the idea is that ComEd was trying to influence Madigan by giving him uh, and his allies something that they wanted. That's one phase of it. They also, as you recall, and we've talked about on this show before, is uh, Madigan wanted Juan Ochoa, the former McPeer chief, to be on the board of directors of ComEd, mm -hmm. a state-regulated utility. So then th uh, they got some resistance internally from uh, about Wanachoa and uh, CEO uh, Ann Promajori uh, uh, reported back to Mike McLean, another lobbyist and mm -hmm. confidant with Madigan. And McLean reported to Madigan, and McK Madigan said, Let's keep pressing. McLean calls uh, uh, Promajori back, and she says, okay, I'll keep pressing. Web. And then he ends up on the board. So in one sense, this is just the export of, of the old patronage system in Chicago politics mm -hmm. that we were familiar with, right. exporting it into the private sector and forcing a private sec private company to hire people who are going to do no work yeah. indirectly as lobbyists. Mm. The new twist there was putting a CHOA on the board of directors. Yeah. That is just incredibly outrageous, very original. We haven't seen it before, and amazing that ComEd went with it. It does show Madigan's power and the fact and how much was at stake yeah. for the company and for us as ratepayers because it was hundreds of millions of dollars that people are paying more because this mm -hmm. market grid program got pushed through the legislature. Right, right. Well, Mike, do you think that these these jury members, were they trying to send a message maybe to other politicians? One of them said, in fact, that they want politics, I think the quote was, to be done the correct way. Yeah. Yeah. So that, to me, says they were sending a message. I don't know, Ray, if you think it was surprising that all four of them were found guilty on all counts. I know there was some talk that... Uh, perhaps the CEO and Promajori might uh, not be found guilty on some of the counts, but did you did you view that as a message, having been? Yeah, I, I thought I, I was not surprised. I was more surprised, actually, that um, all of them went to trial once I saw all the evidence rolling out. Now, it's always a jump ball when you get to a jury, so it could have uh, not convinced one or two of them, but when they came out unanimously... Mm -hmm. And they were all rolling, and they stood up and, and confirmed their votes to the judge when they asked for, to poll the juries. There wasn't anybody who was hesitating. It was a very convincing group. Let's listen to what U.S. Attorney Morris Pascal had to say about the verdict. The criminal conduct in this case was undertaken with corrupt intent to enrich ComEd and to benefit the Speaker of the House and his associates. David, just talk more about the defense's argument here and why it just didn't work. Well, it, it didn't work because uh, it wasn't true. Um, but <laughs> more, <laughs> well, to the, that. more to the point, the, 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 the taping, the tapes that were done were just so incriminating all about the tapes. on so yeah. many different levels. And especially some of the video in those candid moments where... You know, Jay Doherty is yucking it up, I think, with McLean about, oh, look at this smart system we've created to kind of beat the system. Uh, and then the other thing was the risk that they took in putting John Hooker and Ann Promajori on the stand. And uh, and Promajori was a very—I I can see why Ray might have thought she might have skated on one or two counts because yeah. she was a really credible witness. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, she made a mistake or two that uh, maybe cost her— um, some time behind bars. Yeah, yeah. She actually was trying to reinforce one of her points and said, well, as I said to you during our interview, and that gave the prosecution a chance to bring up a uh. prior interview, and that was uh, played out then before the jury that, yeah, she came in, 
She talked to the to the feds uh, initially, and then uh, she quit the interview immediately as soon as the the feds said, well, we have you on tape seeing X, Y, Z. Mm. This is Oops. Reset. I'm Sasha Ann yeah. Simons. We're going behind the headlines in the weekly news recap with Mike Lowe of WGN-TV News, the Chicago Tribune's Ray Long, and David Grising of the Better Government Association. A reminder that you can also watch us right, right now. We're breaking down these news stories on WBEZ's Facebook and YouTube pages. You can leave us a comment or question in that chat box. Talk to us directly. And I just may read what you have to say about the stories on air. Uh, we've got some some chatter happening right now. Shamrock Bloom on YouTube says uh, he's probably wondering, and this is referring to Mike Madigan, he's probably wondering how much time he has left until he is at long last finally convicted. And uh, J.P. Paula says, so will the verdict in the ComEd 4 trial and pending Madigan trial and Ed Burke mean that journalists will stop complaining about, quote, loss of institutional knowledge when several incumbents don't run again? You know, that's a cynical uh, reply. I, I, I appreciate the idea, but the reality is some institutional knowledge does uh, help. Uh, you know, there is an argument for term limits, uh, but when you have people in for, say, six years, then they are not going to have much institutional knowledge, and you hand a lot of it over to the staff, and you hand a lot of it over to the lobbyists. So you have a chance to uh, end your own state rep or senator or U.S. senator every time, uh, every few years, and it's yeah. called an election. You know, there's a lot of unfinished business, though, in the legislature. And specifically, it, one of the disappointing things this week was the response from some of the legislative leaders mm -hmm. who put, got out there and said, well, you know, we've fixed all that. That stuff just doesn't happen anymore. And if they really believe that, um, they're not paying close attention. I mean, we don't know if it's as egregious as it was, but the small matter, small bore ethics reforms that have happened since the Madigan case first emerged yeah. are, are not adequate to the challenge at hand in cleaning up the way si the system works in Springfield. There's a lot of work yet to be done. And if we weren't aware of it previously, we are aware of it now after this trial. Yeah. Has the line between legal lobbying and bribery, has that become clearer for everyone? You well, it, it should be a little bit clearer, but it's still a little bit of a fuzzy line. Yeah. And I think you need, if you have questions, you need a, to ask your attorney about it, you know, and, and try to get some some clear definitions. There should be something clear there. A lot of people are still saying, well, you know, this was just yeah. business as usual, even though they were all convicted. You, you think Madigan's attorney might be encouraging him to, to think hard about a plea deal? Uh, I think it would be hard for Madigan to to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, n nothing is out of the realm of possibility. I think one thing here that makes this a lot different is, you know, we can report about uh, scams and all kinds of uh, shady dealings over the years. But the U.S. attorney had the power of of. Uh, subpoena and they had the power of these recordings and the, the recordings were really compelling and these are things that uh, no matter how uh, good we do our jobs as journalists these are things that we don't have that power for and they were able yeah. to put this over the top with that type of uh, of uh, uh, official power that they have well mike let's not forget about another politician who's probably watching this pretty closely just as our our viewer jp paulus mentioned former alderman ed burke Right. Uh, what might be going through his mind right now? I think after seeing that a trial like this, the convictions that come out of it, he's probably thinking the same thing, that there are tapes. There's the Danny Solis aspect of this. Uh, it depends. We'll have to see what exactly was captured on those tapes. Some mm -hmm. of it has been reported already. But with that evidence, it's really hard to, to put on a defense of your behavior. Yeah. And while this controversy is going on surrounding the former House Speaker, David, employees for the current House Speaker, they've announced that they're actually looking to unionize. What's happening there? Well, this might be one of the unintended consequences of this workers' rights amendment that was passed last November. Uh, there's a movement across the state to unionize in a lot of industries that haven't for completely been unionized yet. And it's hitting the Speaker of the House's office. And so you have a couple dozen staffers who are saying that they're working a lot of comp time that they're not getting paid for. They want to get paid more. They mm -hmm. 
They want better working conditions. The same thing we hear throughout industry. Uh, it's no different in the speaker's office, a apparently, than it is elsewhere. A lot of movement to unionize right. lately. Right. 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 Well, the laws are, are pretty complicated there, that, and, and they are not going to make it easy for the uh, staff to do that unionization. However, uh, this, the sympathy for them is pretty strong, and they do work crazy hours. I worked in the legislature for a long, long time, and uh, they are some of the backbone of what makes the General Assembly go. Mm. So do people like Chris Welch, do they run the risk of being seen as hypocrites if they fight back against this unionization effort after pushing through uh, you know, this very pro-union legislation in other respects? Good oh, they question. do. They do. Yeah. And I don't think, you know, that will bother him a whole lot. They take <laughs> they take arrows on all kinds of He'll issues still every sleep day. At night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll take a pause here and pick up the weekly news recap in just a moment. We've been talking with Chicago Tribune's Ray Long, David Grising of the Better Government Association, and Mike Long with WGN TV News. They'll stick around and be right back. But first, we'll check in with Lisa Lavis. Indiana will have a new law that targets young people who identify as LGBTQ+. Here's Lisa. Yes, Asha, this is expected to go into law, become effective uh, in, in the summer. Indiana's governor yesterday signing a law requiring schools to notify a parent if a student requests a name change or a pronoun change at school. Republican Governor Eric Holcomb also signing into law a bill that could make it easier to ban books from public school libraries. Kentucky Derby is tomorrow. Churchill Downs has suspended trainer Safi Joseph Jr. indefinitely and Lord Miles, who was trained by Joseph. He's been scratched from tomorrow's derby after the sudden death of two of his horses at the track. The suspension prohibits Joseph or any trainer directly or indirectly employed by him from entering horses in races or applying for stalls at all Churchill Downs Incorporated owned tracks. Both horses collapsed on the track and died after races. The head of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is resigning. Dr. Rochelle Walensky says the warn, uh, the waning rather of the COVID pandemic is a pretty good time for her to make a transition. Her last day on the job is June 30th. Walensky was previously an infectious disease specialist at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. This is 91.5 WBEZ and we're glad you're here. Whether you're checking in or you've been with us all day, we're here to serve you. And that service starts with voluntary donations. This is listener-supported WBEZ. Education This Week is a weekly newsletter for parents navigating schools in Chicago and the suburbs from reporters at WBEZ and the Chicago Sun-Times. Sign up now at wbez.org slash education news. This weekend, they're back. But no matter what happens next, the galaxy still needs its guardians. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is the latest film in Marvel's cinematic universe, and everyone's excited, right? Right? We talk superhero fatigue on All Things Considered from NPR News. That's today at 3 o'clock on 91.5 WBEZ. WBEZ is supported by Discover Card and discover.com slash match. Also by Loyola University Chicago School of Environmental Sustainability, empowering the next generation of environmental leaders to solve today's pressing climate challenges. Learn more at luc.edu slash environment. Pretty great looking day. It's a beautiful sunny day. And right now it is 75 degrees at Midway 73 at O'Hare. This is WBEZ. This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. If you're just tuning in, this is our weekly news recap where we make sense of the week's top local and state stories. Now, before the break, we took a deep dive into the guilty verdicts delivered in the ComEd bribery trial, but there's a lot more to get to. A former high-ranking Chicago police officer is set to serve as the Chicago Police Department's interim superintendent when Mayor-elect Brandon Johnson takes office. He has the experience and integrity to lead the Chicago Police Department during this pivotal time. This old school building has remained vacant since 2014, but that may soon change as the city looks to turn the unused structure into a respite center for arriving migrants. City officials are saying this is a humanitarian crisis. Our panel today, Mike Lowe, reporter for WGN TV News, Chicago Tribune investigative reporter Ray Long, and David Grising, president of the Better Government Association. A reminder, if you're watching us online right now on WBEZ's Facebook or YouTube pages, you can feel free to leave us a comment or a question. 
just talk to us in that YouTube chat and I may just read what you have to say on the air. Mike, we'll start with uh, another story here. More than 8,000 migrants have been bused to Chicago since last August. Wow. Over the last few weeks, Texas Governor Greg Abbott has increased the number that he's uh, sending here. What's the latest? Well, Sunday night news broke that more busloads of migrants would be arriving in Chicago and the Chicago area over the next several days. Despite that letter Mayor Lightfoot sent. Mayor Lori Lightfoot sent an open letter to Governor Greg Abbott of Texas saying that he was creating chaos to score political points. Uh, He shot back saying, well, why don't you tell your Democratic president uh, to secure the border? Uh, Meantime, these people are arriving in Chicago and our shelter system is bursting at the seams. It's completely overwhelmed. As you mentioned, there are something like 8,000 migrants who are here. So what's it been like for them? So many of them have been sleeping in police stations uh, on the floor at O'Hare International Airport. And the city is kind of scrambling to find locations where they can be housed uh, safely and uh, one of them is in Avondale at a field house. Uh, I believe it's at uh, Brands Park, uh, the field house. Mm-hmm. R- uh, residents and neighbors around there are kind of up in arms saying, we got no heads up about this. And the city has to say, well, we barely got a heads up about this. and We're, again, scrambling. Um, but they've had to move you know, camps and after-school activities uh, from that location. Mm. And then last night, there was a very tense meeting in South Shore because of Mayor Lightfoot's plan to reopen South Shore High School uh, to put some of the migrants there uh, as as what was called a temporary respite site. Wow. Uh, Well, what's Mayor-elect Johnson saying about turning that former high school into migrant housing? He's noncommittal, but says he will revisit the Lightfoot administration's uh, plan here. Um, I think there's a sense in the community that this is going to increase tensions between the black and Latino communities. There's a sense in South Shore that because that was one of the 50 schools closed in the Emanuel administration, that harm was done to their community and they were not uh, ever kind of made whole from that. And now other people from the outside, that's what you heard from uh, residents who were speaking at this meeting last night, that outsiders are coming in, taking resources from their community. So there's, there's a real kind of sticky situation here where Chicago wants to be this welcoming city and says it's open to this kind of thing. But once it starts happening in neighborhoods, the people are saying, we got to think about how we're doing this. Wow. Uh, Ray, David, I mean, does this seem to you like a humanitarian crisis happening in our backyard? Yes. And I think people ought to be stepping up, you know, uh, where are the hotel owners who have extra rooms, where are the churches, and this is not to say some of them aren't stepping up, but uh, if you are going to actually be humanitarian and live the, the uh, I guess, walk the walk is the, is the uh, phrase that would be appropriate, then you, you need to figure out a way to put, uh, and a place to put people, and abandoned schools may be the best place for some temporarily. It, it's better than sleeping on a police uh, police district floor or on the floor at O'Hare. I mean, good grief. These are individual people who yeah. need care and a, a hand up. I want to get your thoughts as well, David, but I, I first want to weave in a comment that we got online from J.P. Paulus, who says, uh, I'm sympathetic to the situation and says my parents were immigrants. But isn't what we're facing what Texas and California face literally every day? We need immigrant reform that deals with us and the homelands. Well, well, that, that's a fair point. And um, unfortunately, we have uh, politicians like Governor Abbott of Texas and Governor DeSantis of Florida taking advantage of that sort of fair-minded question and forcing the issue in a way where these helpless defenseless people are being used as political pawns. Mm. And um, the a difference between the situation at the border in Texas and putting people into neighborhoods, parks, and empty schools in Chicago is that these people are being plunked down in very active communities, whereas the Texas border tends to be a little bit more remote. So it's yeah. not exactly identical. And the border is also set up. It's not adequate for the numbers who are coming across the border. But it's, the border is set up to receive these people and to process them appropriately. And when you throw them on a plane or a bus and move them to a neighborhood that is just not prepared for it, you are putting them in, uh, 
at very best, a very unhealthy and and potentially unsafe yeah. situation. Sylvia Garcia on YouTube says, thank you, Ray, for emphasizing the, the migrants' humanity. Uh, Mike, we talked about what Mayor Lightfoot's doing right now. Anything from the governor in response to the increase here of migrants coming to the state? You know, I, I haven't seen a statement from the governor. I'm sure he probably either. has addressed it. In the past, he's talked about uh, Illinois being a welcoming place, uh, standing for values uh, such as, you know, being on the side of the humanitarian aspect of this. But uh, I have not seen specifically in this most recent round anything from J.B. Pritzker. Yeah. Are we going to be seeing more people sent here, especially leading up to, to next summer's Democratic convention? Well, I think that's a good question. I also think another, uh, you know, going back to the first segment, another thing that's interesting is Mike Madigan's trial is set for April 1st. If it goes very long, it'll be like on the eve of the convention. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Uh, This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. We're going behind the headlines in our weekly news recap with Mike Lowe of WGN-TV News, the Chicago Tribune's Ray Long, and David Grising of the Better Government Association. Switching gears, folks, uh, Mayor-elect Johnson has named a new police superintendent, at least for now. What do we know about Fred Waller, David? Well, he resigned a couple, about three years ago from the police force. At the time, he was the third in command. He was chief of patrol. He was a career-long Chicago police officer, 34 years in the service. And uh, right now, he's 61 years old. Um, he has a good reputation within the police force. He does have one sort of questionable blot on his record, which was uh, when dealing with uh Maggie Hickey, who is uh, the um, monitor of the police consent decree Mm -hmm. and dealing with some of the uh, requirements that Maggie Hickey was making, he said something about uh, the quote is, grope me, don't rape me. And he, of course, I'm I'm sure sure immediately regretted saying Mm -hmm. so. And he, in fact, was reprimanded, uh, suspended for almost a month for uh, for that. Um, Nevertheless, uh, his record otherwise has been viewed in a positive light. And um, because he will be coming in as the interim uh, while this new Community Commission on Public Safety selects three candidates for Mayor Brandon Johnson to appoint ultimately one of those more than likely. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if he doesn't like those three, he gets to, the commission goes back and gives him another three to choose from. It's, there's a view that perhaps he ends up having a leg up and possibly almost being put into that pool because yeah. of his, Johnson has said he wants, he wants the new superintendent to come from the force, if at all possible. He's of the But Waller's view. saying he doesn't want the permanent job. Well, people say that, don't they, sometimes? They do. Yeah. They yeah. do say yeah. that sometimes. Yeah. They say they're not running for president, then they do. <laughs> right, you know. right, right. It, it would be a short trial run, but a trial run nonetheless. Right. And as we're talking about, this is something that Brandon Johnson has said he wants, somebody with a history in the department, a Chicagoan that doesn't have to know or get be brought up to speed on the neighborhoods and everything like that, the dynamics. So it looks like this could be like we were talking about, a leg up for him if he decides. I don't know, has he officially put his application in yet? Well, I a couple so. no, of days. As, as of the last reporting on it, no, he had not applied for the job. But um, the, the way these things work, mm-hmm. uh, that's yeah. often a formality. And one of the things that he does bring, besides just those years of service, having run patrol, yeah. that's where David Brown's biggest problem was. Yeah. He didn't seem to know how to organize the cops on the street Mm -hmm. to effectively fight especially violent crime in certain neighborhoods of the city. And somebody who has run the patrol unit, um, they at least have a plan or have seen various plans tried and have their own ideas. The ear on the ground that he had should give him a real substantial leg up if he really wants the job. Uh, because you think this is a trial run for that permanent job? Who, who really knows? I mean, if he if he messed up, it'd be a trial run for sure. If he, if he <laughs> handles, it, handles it pretty smoothly, well, you know, it, it would uh, be a good reflection of him. We've got Memorial Day coming up. We've got July 4th coming up. Those are uh, dates that uh, have a tendency to see bad things happen in Chicago. All eyes so, will be on Waller. Yes. Well, that is the good thing about this timing is those are those testing dates. And and it comes against the backdrop of this horrid events that happened downtown just a couple of weeks ago uh, in which 
we've seen how badly things can go if you don't make adequate plans for them. Mm -hmm. And um, this is an instance also where Brandon Johnson has talked about, like, people will come back, cops will come back. We're down by about 1,700 officers uh, since Mayor Lori Lightfoot took office. And so we'll see if that begins to happen. And having somebody, a familiar face like that at yeah. the head of the department might be a help in that regard. Mike, let's talk about some other police-related news here. Uh, there was video released of a fatal police shooting that happened in the West Side Garfield Park neighborhood. This was back on April 15th. What did the video show? Well, the Civilian Office of Police Accountability this week released that video showing uh, what police said was, it, it was a foot chase. Police said they were uh, holding what they called a gang de-escalation mission and saw okay. this 24-year-old Reginald Clay uh, standing there, they approached him and he ran away through a gangway. Um, at some point, he had a gun in his right hand, and the video shows that he tried to transfer it to his left hand and place it onto a porch. At the time that, in that moment uh, when that was happening, police opened fire and he was shot five times and killed. Uh, again, this happened back on April 15th. We just saw the video mm. this week. Um, it, it appears, again, that he was trying to, to shift the gun and maybe set it down. His parents uh, held an angry uh, protest and news conference yeah, saying, the family saying they're saying that he was murdered. They want justice for their son. They want the officer fired and arrested for murder. Um, and right now, uh, those officers are on administrative leave uh, as the protests continue. These stories are happening far too often. Uh, before They've we... also fired a, uh, filed a federal lawsuit, by the way. The, the family has. The family you know, has. Watching that, that video, you get the idea of when you hear cops say how fast these things happen, I had to slow it down in order to kind of see that gun transferred. And it does look like perhaps he was trying to put it on the deck that he was standing near. But when you're at risk of being shot if you're a cop, it, it I I see the point that these police officers Split make about Split second decisions. Yeah, it's it, got to be really hard. It reminded me of the Adam Toledo. Like, Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. 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 And it's uh, the first place my mind went to. Yeah, and you get that uh, you in that case too you had to slow it down to watch what was really happening. And can you expect a cop who's been running chasing somebody uh heart pounding sees a gun and then, um, you know, it's a very difficult equation the, the to sort is, out. Should, should they be chasing? That's yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's interesting. Absolutely. That you, should they be putting themselves in that situation? You, you and, bring up the chase, Toledo case, and that right? was one of the cases that brought about the new policy on foot chases. Like our foot mm -hmm. chase is mm -hmm. necessary. That's another thing that the family is saying, that right. this was a violation of that new policy, that he never should have been chased in the first place, that the officer should not have been in that position mm -hmm. to have fired the weapon. David, before we take a quick break, Illinois' assault weapons ban was making headlines this week uh, again. Just get us up to speed on the, the legal challenges well, there, at this point. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so you really, many things uh, you, have happened. You can barely tell this player is without like, a scorecard. Is it banned or is it not? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on where in the state you are, and it depends uh, which on the district, week. <laughs> but, but the. the where, what really matters is that it has now gone to the Supreme Court for, okay. uh, for Justice Amy Coney Barrett to uh, take a look as to whether she wants to, con whether she thinks it's appropriate to continue the injunction against enforcement of this uh, assault weapons ban, which was put in place by a downstate U.S. District Court judge, uh, Stephen McGlynn. McGlynn talked about the 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 law itself, the Illinois law, which bans. Uh, the sale of assault, sale and possession of, of assault weapons, as well as uh, magazines of certain sizes. There's also a Naperville law that's been dragged into the or ordinance that's been dragged into this. But anyhow, M McClinn said, "Hey, just because terrible pe people do terrible things with these assault weapons, does not mean that they ought to be illegal." And he is trying to follow a very recent Supreme Court ruling that talks about. If the regulation in, in question is similar to regulations that were in force at the time the Constitution was framed, uh, then they're, um, they're okay, and if not, they shouldn't be allowed. Well, the framers didn't anticipate assault weapons, but they did anticipate the notion of the government telling you you can't own a weapon, and this Supreme Court uh, likely won't uphold this law, one might guess, except that Governor J.B. Pritzker is steadfast in saying, yeah, we know what the Supreme Court we're dealing with. This law was drafted in order to clear Supreme Court review. It's going to make it through. 
I mm. guess we'll wait and see. <laughs> Governor Pritzker has said they they believe it's kind of airtight, but the case that's being referenced is that Bruin case from New York mm-hmm. that essentially established strict scrutiny as the standard by which any constitutional right like this is has to be measured. So they're saying if if this is an infringement on a constitutional right, there has to be some sort of much more extraordinary reason for this rather than, uh, I, I believe, I, wrote, I jotted this down, uh, it must be consistent with uh, the historical tradition of firearm regulation. And so the, the side that wants to see this ban go away is saying the tradition of AR-15s is we haven't regulated them this heavily in the past. Mm-hmm. So we'll see what the Supreme Let's Court says. We'll pick up the weekly news recap in just a moment with Mike Long of WGN-TV News, David Greisling of the Better Government Association, and Chicago Tribune's Ray Long. The first record snowfall hits Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Here's Lisa. Hey, you want to go, Sasha? Let's go skiing, huh? The National Weather Service says parts of the UP are under a little more than 28 inches of snow. The Weather Service says all the snow fell between Sunday morning and Tuesday afternoon at its office in Marquette, Michigan. Meteorologist Don Rolson says this is the snowiest May on record in that city. It overlooks Lake Superior. U.S. health regulators are weighing the first ever request to make a birth control pill available without a prescription. The Food and Drug Administration today posting its initial review of a decades-old pill that could become the first drug of its kind to move over the counter. An FDA advisory panel is voting next week on whether it should be approved for that use. Adidas is reportedly getting a little closer to making a decision on what to do with $1.3 billion worth of high-end Yeezy sneakers after splitting with the rapper, formerly known as Kanye West. The shoes have been just sitting in warehouses for nearly seven months since the German sportswear company ended ties with Yee over his anti-Semitic and other offensive remarks. Adidas says the breakup cost it $441 million in sales. On the next Science Friday... The rats are absolutely going to hate this announcement. But the rats don't run this city. We do. But do we really... Rats have lived in cities with us for millennia, and they are still thriving. Poison and rat traps aren't clearing them out, so how do we control them? Some answers on Science Friday from WNYC Studios. That's this afternoon at 1 o'clock on WBEZ Chicago. Hey, Nerdettes, Greta Johnson here. You are invited to join me and the very funny Samantha Irby live on stage as we talk about her new book and take some of your questions. It's on Thursday, May 18th at Loyola's Mundelein Center. More at wbez.org slash events. Hi, it's Steve Inskeep. If you believe in the mission of this station, but now's not the right time for a financial gift, try another way to help. Donate a vehicle you don't need. Pickup is free. Find out how at wbez.org slash car. WBEZ is supported by Wrightwood 659 with three new exhibits now open, including Shadal alum singed but not burnt, photographs of Bangladeshi resistance tickets at Wrightwood659.org. Also, Live Nation presenting Gladys Knight making her return to the Chicago Theater on May 11th. Tickets available now at Ticketmaster.com and by Temple Sholem hosting Healing Through Action, the Trannon Family Gun Violence Symposium with Oswad Thomas and Senator Chris Murphy, May 7th and 8th. Details at shalomchicago.org. This is WBEZ. This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. We are back with more of our weekly news recap, giving you a closer look at the week's top stories across Chicago and Illinois. Now, before the break, we took a close look at preparations that are being made for busloads of new migrants coming here from Texas, but we still got more news to cover. Our panel today is Mike Lowe, reporter for WGN-TV News, Chicago Tribune investigative reporter Ray Long, and David Greising, president of the Better Government Association. We're still on Facebook and YouTube, so continue to chat with us. Our friends uh, Shamrock Bloom chimed in on our uh, chat in, in the last segment there about the, the shooting in uh, West Garfield Park, the unfortunate fatal police shooting. Shamrock Bloom says, why does anyone need to be shot five times? That was a killing in cold blood. The officer was not threatened. And earlier, as we talked about uh, migrants coming here from the the southern border, D Farm says Chicago declared itself a sanctuary city. So this is the natural result of this. Talking about the influx of folks coming here uh, to find a home. All right, switching gears. Good news, gang. Chicago is getting three new public libraries. Who doesn't deserve a a library? (laughs) Yeah, Mayor Lightfoot announced uh, that there will be three new Chicago Public Library branches coming to historically underserved parts of the west and south side 
that will serve as what she calls hubs of activity and lifelong learning. One will be in Woodlawn, another in Back of the Yards, and one in Humboldt Park. Nice. Um, these will serve, uh, actually, I think the ones in Back of the Yards and Humboldt Park will be part of mixed-use development. So there will be some residential uh, living units there and maybe some some other aspects to the, de- the development that will kind of serve as community uh, centers oh. uh, for these for these areas. Um and uh, I, for the most part, this is was greeted with uh, I was gonna say, wide how are people applause. Yeah, about this? People, yeah, I'm sure th- these are happy. things that people in in these neighborhoods have been clamoring for, uh, and are finally getting. We love the funds. libraries, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> sticking with libraries, though, a bill that's preventing library book bans has passed the Illinois Senate. It already passed in the House, right, David? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, waiting Governor Pritzker's uh, signature. The um, uh, the bill was initiated by Alexei Janulius, the Secretary of State, who is, I guess, the state's librarian. Uh, yeah, I just learned that a few weeks ago. That's part of his duties. I'm like re-shocked every time we bring it up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but but this is really interesting in the national context because we're seeing states uh, go after uh, library, certain books in libraries, uh, some uh, 1,200 libraries nationwide have begun to ban books. As many as 2,500 different titles have been banned to our knowledge, to general knowledge. And uh, right across the border in Indiana, they've actually got a bill that is um, even more restrictive and actually had would con- potential uh, criminal liability. That would make for, it easier in Indiana to, to, to ban, ban books. books and yeah. would have potential criminal li- liability for librarians who keep books that are on the banned list. And so uh, it, Illinois, is, uh, in, as it has in many other respects, is uh, going against the tide of this sort of uh, conservative social uh, agenda and saying, no, we want, ba- we want books uh, covering uh, various uh, gender and sexuality issues and uh, um, race issues mm-hmm. to stay in our libraries. Ray, let's turn to something very different. Uh, An Aurora man was charged with threatening to kill Governor Pritzker. Yes, uh, a guy named uh, Stephen Woolitz. uh, He's 46. He uh, apparently uh, left a real bad threatening, full of uh, bad words, uh, message that also included the uh, comments about the governor and the governor's mother. And then he said, I'm going to blank kill you you silly blank blank and i think he even left out one of the blanks so anyway he's been uh given a court date he was actually bonded out which is um interesting and he is given he's a, free on ten thousand dollars bail yeah yeah and uh, in the meantime according to the daily herald he's been ordered to stay away from pritzker and his family and not to communicate with him and he's also ordered to undergo alcohol use monitoring Stephen Wallets. Hmm. We've been hearing in the news that the uh, the Jewish community is receiving an increased number of threats as well. Mike, uh, you had a story about this uh, this week. It was about a, a Chicago organization tracking this. Yeah, this is uh, the uh, Anti Defamation League put out a report at the end of last month that showed that the threats and incidents of anti Semitism have been the highest they've ever been since the organization started tracking them in 1979. So more than four decades, this is the worst climate, the worst threat uh, Mm. climate that that they've ever seen. Um, And there is an organization... Did they have any thoughts as to why? There there are a couple things. Uh, I think probably our listener or your listeners will remember, for example, Kanye West and Kyrie Irving, two very prominent uh, people, shared anti-Semitic information with millions of followers on social media. Uh, I think it's a lot easier to get messages out from what typically used to be fringe groups can now put stuff out on the Internet and Mm -hmm. and it gets passed around the world. Um, But there's a group called the Secure Community Network here in Chicago that uh, bills itself as the official safety and security organization of the Jewish community. And this week we got an inside look on Channel 9 at their uh, at their 
uh, command center, which serves as as a tracking uh, for every incident in North America that happens. They they wow. kind of pinpoint it and they geofence every in North um, America in all over North America. Uh, and interesting when they see these are it's staffed by former uh, law enforcement officials, staffed by tech uh, company people, t- uh, staffed by an intelligence analysts, and they're kind of seeing what happens. They're looking at the dark web, trying to pull this information to see where threats could happen. But this group also trains the uh, potential targets on how to deal with something like that if a synagogue were to be attacked, telling people how to respond. Mm. Um, So it's an interesting uh, kind of response to this new wave of threats that, that we're seeing. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a look at news in other areas of the state. Uh, the city council in downstate Danville narrowly passed a ban on mailing abortion pills. What are those details, David? Well, uh, that wasn't an easy decision for the city council. It was a four-hour meeting. Some of the debate was rather acrimonious. Um, this uh, would, action was taken uh, in a narrow vote, despite the fact that the American Civil Liberties Union has said they're going to sue to prevent it. Uh, uh, the Attorney General of Illinois, Kwame Rural, sent a letter saying that this action is not going to is going to be illegal in, according to Illinois law. Governor Pritzker himself has said that the Reproductive Health Act forbids this. Uh, nevertheless, the Danville City Council went ahead. They're banning uh, the sale and mailing of abortion pills, and I would just say, stay tuned because. Danville residents are probably going to be paying quite a lot in legal bills in order to defend this action. Yeah, what's the likelihood Danville can actually enforce this? Uh, I, I would expect that there will be a lawsuit. There will probably be an injunction against enforcement, yeah. and then it'll be fought out in court. Um, a rare dust storm south of Springfield on uh, I-55. That also made headlines. It caused a devastating 72-car pileup, killing seven people. Uh, I mean, you drive down to Springfield pretty regularly. Well, yeah, I've been there. This is south of Springfield, too. And what's unusual about this one is not only the the terrible crash and fatalities, but it's unusual it happened on I-55. I've uh, lived downstate many, many years, and uh, you see this type of dust storm more on I-57, which is the road that goes down to Champaign and on down south from mm-hmm. there. And uh, I was surprised to see it kicked up. I've seen some of the video, of course, and uh, it was just like impossible to see. It was wild. It, yeah. And and also, from what I'm, I've been reading, it, it typically happens more in late summer, like yeah. August. So May is also unheard of. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, possibilities there are that farmers are out planting and had loosened some f- soil, uh, but it is uh, also the force of the wind that day. It's an unusual uh, speed and unusual uh, strength of that wind that also caused it. it. The pileup was so bad that they found six fatalities and, and announced it one day, and then they found another the next day because oh. the wreckage was so bad. Wow. Mm. Well, any other stories that stuck out to you, gentlemen, this week? I mean, maybe something that surprised you, like this dust storm one surprised Ray, or uh, maybe something that you heard that you thought, geez, that's pretty underreported. We should be talking more about this thing. I don't know if uh, front page of the Chicago Tribune counts as underreported, but the inspector general's uh, report about uh, the transportation secretary allowing uh, people in his office to, uh, Omer Ousman is the transportation secretary's name, allowing people to uh, basically step away from certain duties right before they retire so that that they don't become subject to a revolving door prohibition that prevents them from taking business or taking jobs with companies that they've been doing business with mm. in their official capacity. That's really troubling if if those allegations are, are true, uh, that the system would be manipulated this way. Those revolving door provisions are put in effect for us to be protected from people doing yeah. self-serving things as they're about to leave their, jo- their public service jobs. That's a good one, David. I think uh, one interesting story involves the the Bears and the Arlington Park situation. Uh, Fritz Kagi, the uh, Cook County assessor, reassessed the property at five times higher, uh, five times increasing the How value. How does that happen? <laughs> well, I think it's uh, coincidence, right? Yeah, just a coincidence. <laughs> um, but it would end up having the Bears pay something like 16, 15 or $16 million more a year than 
what had been previously paid on that property. Yeah, I think it went from like thirty three million to like a hundred and ninety seven. Exactly, and so I, you know, I, it probably isn't enough to tank a huge, uh, you know, project like this, multi billion dollars. But it's just interesting to keep watching what's happening develop with. Uh, property taxes, how yeah. the bears. I, I think the, the Arlington Heights, one of the legislators from that area had proposed legislation freezing property taxes yeah. for 40 years or something like that. I don't think that will yeah. go Another anywhere. Another coincidence, yeah. no yeah. doubt. Yeah. 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 Are you all excited to watch the Arlington Heights bears? No, I'd <laughs> like to see them at Soldier Field where they should be. And uh, it's just, you know, if they can spend billions on that, then get me another receiver and a couple of <laughs> a better, uh, you know. Couple where was of, our defensive some, end? We yeah. got some right, new players right, exactly. recently. We got some new players. Yeah, we, we didn't get our good. edge yeah. rusher in the, yeah. in the draft. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you're not going to drive up to Arlington Heights? Well, I won't eliminate any possibility, but I, <laughs> but I will say that I'd rather watch them at Soldier it's Field be a state of or the art at home. facility and or entertainment at, district. Uh, Come whatever. on. The real question is what happens to Soldier Field uh, longer term. Uh, that'll be a story that we ought to be And I'll call you back to talk about it. Maybe there'll be a new <laughs> mini bears or something. Yeah, like for sure. Well, let's look ahead to, to next week. What are you watching for, David? I mean, you, you've got your pulse on pretty much everything. <laughs> well, let's see. Next week, we're, no, it's not quite inaugural. I'm, I'm just very focused You're on the Brandon Johnson inauguration. I know, so I, know. I can't wait for the 15th. This change in the, the I guess, more announcements from Johnson about appointments. I, I, that has been a really compelling story. You mean the four dozen we We've heard of was yeah, it enough for it, you. He's, uh, you know, just, he's filling out his administration with people who have some serious chops, and that's really encouraging, given that he comes in with a relative lack of experience. Yeah. What about you, Mike? What are you uh, next week? Uh, working on a couple of things. Uh, on Wednesday night, we'll have a story about the COVID learning gap. Um, so all the students who fell behind during remote learning and what's being done to kind of help them catch up. Uh, That's CP- a great follow-up. C- CPS is uh, instituting what they're calling like targeted high dosage uh, tutoring. And then one other story, it's kind of a fun story. Uh, next Tuesday, I believe, is the 75th anniversary of Superdog in Gladstone oh. Park, oh. Uh, a, a Chicago institution, one of the, the best hot dogs. Although say, if you say in. hot dog there, they'll correct you immediately and say, it's not a hot dog, it's a super dog. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, but they are super. I'm glad they you told great. me that. <laughs> so, because uh, I would I would have been the one walking in like, hi, uh, I'll get a uh, hot dog. And I won't say what I'll put on it because I've already I've already <laughs> gotten phone calls and emails <laughs> from listeners about my ketchup situation. Oh, so we, won't go, we won't go Sasha. there. <laughs> we won't go there. Just don't tell anybody. Okay? <laughs> she just real, did. Real quick, Ray, what, what do you I'm going to Super Dog. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll leave it there. My thanks to the Chicago Tribune's Ray Long, David Grising of the Better Government Association, and Mike Lowe, reporter at WGN News. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. That's it for Reset. The show's produced by Meha Ahmed, Stephanie Kim, Linnea Dominic, Brenda Ruiz, Micah Yason, Claire Hyman, Michael Liptrot, Andrea Guthman, and Andrew Merriweather. Dan Tucker's our executive producer, and Ethan Schwab is our engineer. Monday on the show, get this, American Idol stars Ruben Studdard and Clay Aiken. They are reuniting for a 20-year anniversary tour, and they are stopping in the Chicago area for three of those shows. So we are going to, of course, catch up with the singing powerhouses. Why not? That's on Monday. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great weekend. Shout out to the folks on YouTube and Facebook. Love you guys. We'll meet again soon. It is 12.58. Right up next, we've got Science Friday, a little fun science news for you just ahead. WBEZ is supported by UI Health announcing its new specialty care building and outpatient surgery center located in the heart of the Illinois Medical District. Learn more at UIHealth.care. A healthier future starts at UI Health. On last week's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, country star Brad Paisley talked about playing his songs for his teenage kids. So we listened to it in the kitchen and... <laughs> and then Huck, my oldest, said, well, they can't all be gems. 